course, we've been in our series on the Holy Spirit, but we're going to shift directions a little bit this morning. We've got Thanksgiving coming up in a couple weeks, and I just wanted to spend a couple weeks uh, talking to you about being thankful and um, just some things that the Lord put on my heart about that. And, uh, you know, we live in a, a very unthankful world. And uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's getting worse, but it just seems like the more we have and the more we acquire and the more that we are handed, the less grateful we are for it, you know, as a, as a, as a nation and as a people. Um, but, you know, in Scripture, we are commanded over 68 times, specifically this exact phrase is found, to give thanks. Over 68 times in the New Testament we're commanded. And of course that doesn't include all of the, the kind of peripheral references, but specifically commanded 68 times to give thanks unto God. And you know, thankfulness is not just something that, uh, it's not like a thank you note that you write. Or it's not necessarily uh, even, even words that you say. Thankfulness is something that begins in your heart. It begins with the, the way that you view life, the way that you live the way that you see the world and the, the perspective that you live with. You know, I, over the years I've worked at different churches and uh, even, even now still uh, am a big part of this here. But, you know, we put on, I've always been a part of putting on events, large events, you know, youth camps, fall, fall fests, um, different, different events. And over the years it's been interesting because sometimes you'll be at these events that, for example, one, one, one church I was at, we were part of doing a youth camp that had close to 500 people there and, and uh, 10 churches were involved. It was a big, big event. And, uh, you know, when I would go, a lot of times people would not know me. They would not know who I was. They wouldn't know that I had a lot to do with putting the event on. And so you'd be walking around and you would hear a, you would hear a conversation or you'd hear or maybe they'd say it to you because they didn't know who you were and it was amazing to listen to people talking when they didn't realize that they were being listened to and the things that would come out of their mouth. And uh this this actually happened at Fall Fest. This this last Fall Fest was kind of this has happened several years, but this happened this year specifically where my family and I were here and I was dressed up a little funny, and I don't even know if people would have recognized me anyway because uh, we had a lot of visitors, and people had no idea who I was. And I was standing in line uh, with my kids at one of the games, and the couple right in front of me, they, they don't go to this church. They were, you know, I guess visiting. And they started, you know, kind of talking negative about some of the things about the event. And so after I reached up and just kind of popped them right in the back of the head, <laughs> you just kind of right there and watched the little hair fly forward. No, I didn't do that. But I, I sat there and thought to myself, I actually kind of enjoyed it. I actually kind of engaged them about what they were talking about. And uh, I just thought to myself afterward, you know, isn't it, isn't it interesting that it really doesn't matter what we go to in this nation, that if we want to, we can criticize it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Not, not saying that our fall fest is perfect by any means, but I'll say this, it is free. <laughs> and uh, I sure enjoyed it. And uh, I had a good time. But, you know, I was just sitting there and I'm thinking, man, here, here, here are people that can come and, and they take it, they, they, they participate and they receive from the, the blessing that it is, and it's meant to be a blessing. But sometimes because of the, the condition of our heart, we can't, we don't, we don't see it from the right perspective and we don't find thankfulness in our heart, but instead we find ungratitude, ingratitude. And it's easy to look at, you know, that situation and go, oh, how, how could you do that? How could you say that? But really, I want us to look inward this morning. And I want to say, you know, what are, some, what are some things in our life that God has blessed us with that He is expecting an attitude of thankfulness, but when He looks at us, all He sees is an attitude of ingratitude? What are some things that God is looking at in our life that He's expecting us to give Him praise for, but all He hears is complaining? I don't want God to look down on my life and, and think that or see that. I want God to look down on my life and see the blessings that he's blessed me with and say, oh, man, look how thankful. I'm ready to give him more. I'm ready to pour out some more on him because look how thankful he is for what I've given him. Isn't that how we are? You know, if you, if you, give, if you start giving your kids stuff and it seems that for some reason all it's doing is producing ungratefulness, what happens? The flow dries up. You turn off the faucet. 
Why? Because that's, that's the human heart. That's the human condition. For whatever reason, the more we receive, a lot of times it does not produce thankfulness. A lot of times, the more we receive, the more it produces unthankfulness. And we are in danger of this, every one of us, because of the nation, just, by, just alone because of the nation that we live in. We live in a nation that has opulent wealth. That anything that you want is just a click away. And now, we barely even have to wait for it. You know, you got Amazon Prime, two-day shipping, free, free two-day shipping. The, the world is wide open. All you do is you search the web and you get whatever you want just to click away and find the best price, the best value, and 500 people that bought it before you telling you whether it was good or whether it was bad, and you find the best of the best, and you pay the best price, and it's here within two days. But that wasn't good enough. So now, Amazon, I don't know if y'all know if they're, they're working on this, but now they have one-hour delivery in some, in some cities. They started in Indianapolis, I think, but their, their goal is to spread to everywhere in the United States. One-hour delivery. Hey, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about it. I love Amazon. We buy so much off of there. But the point is that the more you get used to that kind of customer service, the more you get used to being treated with that level of excellence and that level of speed and that level of quality, the more you get used to being treated like that, the more unthankful you are for the simple things. It's amazing. But we live in a world, and, and see, consumerism produces unthankfulness. Because what, what we have in our nation right now is every, every business, and please don't misunderstand, I love capitalism. I love the nation we live in. I'm not, any, by any way, I'm not a person that comes, I love living in America. Okay, not coming against that anyway, but there are some negative effects to the nation that we live in, and we have to understand that. Because consumerism produces this where every business is competing for your attention and more specifically for your money. And so they are constantly coming up with new ways to impress you, constantly coming up with new ways to outserve and outdo the other company. And what does, that, what does that leave in us but this attitude of, like, what you got? What's next? You know, so-and-so company did it this way. What are you going to do? So you, before you know it, you know, you're showing up at the hotel, and it's not enough that the room is clean and, and the climate is controlled. You know, they didn't put a mint on my pillow like the other place did. And the bar of soap is not tied up just perfect like I wanted it. And if you're not careful, you can begin to live with this mentality of, Come on, out, out, outdo yourself, outdo the other business. And people start competing, and they're not competing for you. They don't, they don't love you by any shape. They just love your money. They're after your money. So all of a sudden, every TV commercial, every billboard, every Google Internet ad is a reminder of something that you don't have and something that someone else has and that you need to have, and that if you work hard enough, you can get it, instead of just being thankful and content with what you have. You don't see this attitude in Scripture of constantly striving for more and more and building more and getting more and acquiring more and more. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but more of what you see and what you see the Apostle Paul preaching is being content with what you have. And that whatever state of life that you're in, being content with it. Now, there is an element of stewardship and an element of giving and an element of generosity that is going to naturally lead to increase in your life. You know, if, if, you're, if you're following the principles of Scripture, you're going to increase. But let me tell you something. As you increase and you do it God's way, thankfulness will also increase in your life. Thankfulness will also increase in your heart. That's why the Bible says that the, the uh, that the, how's it say? Now I'm forgetting exactly the wording of it. But basically he says that uh, the blessings of the Lord make rich, but add no sorrow with it. So even though we increase in wealth and we increase in blessing, it will not be a sorrowful thing. It will not be ungrateful. It will not be accompanied by um, these negative effects, but it will be comfort, it will be accompanied by blessing. Amen. Look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7.
God was speaking to the children of Israel, and he was getting ready to bring them into the promised land. And he was, he was warning them about this tendency that we're talking about this morning. This is Deuteronomy 8, 7. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates. Now, now listen to all this. I mean, you've got to understand, they've been in the wilderness for 40 years. And when they hear, we don't think much about this. Okay, so there's a few streams and there's a few fruit trees. Big deal. You know, I go down to the grocery store and get everything I need. That, that doesn't really sound. But to a people that didn't have any grocery stores and they've been in the wilderness for 40 years, can you imagine how this sounds to their ears? They've had to believe God for their water. They've had to believe God for their food. They've had to trust and believe God for everything. And here he's telling them, look, I'm bringing you to a, a, into a land where it just flows. Water flows. Fountains, spring, valleys, vineyards, wheat, barley. A land of olive trees and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. In which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Isn't God good? I mean, look at how he wants to bless them. This was his plan for them. He never wanted the things that ended up happening to the nation of Israel to happen. He never wanted them to be ransacked by another nation. He never wanted them to lose everything that he had promised them. He never wanted them to experience judgment. This was his plan, to bring them into a land filled with fruit and honey and iron and everything. All the blessings of God. But listen to this, verse 11. He says, take care lest you forget the Lord your God. By not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Now, isn't that amazing? How could you forget? He, after where they've come from and after what they've experienced. First of all, we, we talk about the wilderness, but what about before that? I mean, slavery. Slave to the Egyptians, building, working, being beat and whipped in the, in the, in the, the bounds of slavery. He brings them out into the wilderness, so that's better than the other, but it's still the wilderness. And, and again, you know, going through that whole thing. And then he says, I'm bringing you into this place, but once I bring you there, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. How could they forget? How is that even possible? I mean, if, if you were one of the children of Israel and you'd been in slavery and then you'd been in the wilderness and all of a sudden you came into this land where everything is just at your fingertips and you're literally drenched and steeped in the blessings of God, how could you possibly forget the God that brought you there? Well, it, it shouldn't shock us because America is doing it right now. We have forgotten God in a lot of ways. We have come from obscurity. We came from oppression to a land of freedom. And, and who came? It was the Puritans that came. And their, their goal and their desire, and, and this is part of why we celebrate Thanksgiving, their goal and their desire was to, to, was to create a society that was completely built and founded on the Word of God. Every aspect of society started with God's law. That's how this nation was founded. And oh, sure, history books are being rewritten. Lies are being told about how this nation was founded and about the leaders and the men and women that started this country. But make no mistake about it, God was at the center. And the only reason that this nation has experienced the blessing that it has is because God's blessing was on this nation. How could we forget March 30th, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln appointed a national day of fasting. And this is what he said. 
We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. We have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. Now, I wonder if that were true in President Lincoln's day. If he thought that they had forgotten God in 1863, where does that leave us in 2015? When I look around this nation, I do not see, by and large, an indebtedness, a mentality that we are forever indebted to our God. That everything we have in this nation the wealth that we have, the peace and the prosperity that we have is because of God's protection. Oh, we look to the laws that were made and oh, we've our, mil, our great military. Listen, we're not the first nation to have a great military. We're not the first nation to have great wealth. Don't ever put your trust in the wealth or in the military or in this great nation. Oh, we're the greatest nation in the world. We are the greatest nation in the world. But if we want to stay that way, we've got to keep God at the center and not push him out of everything. Now, you may be thinking, well, you know, you're preaching to the choir. We all, we all believe that. We all think that this morning. Yeah, but let me tell you, the more you live in a society that thinks this way, if you're not careful, it'll rub off on you. If you're not careful, you'll find this level of entitledness and ingratitude coming. But I'm going to tell you something. I am so thankful to my God for the nation that I live in. And I give him all the praise and all the glory, not just for the nation that we live in, but for anything that I experience in my life. I thank God for my spouse. I thank God for my kids. I thank God for this church. None of it would be possible without him. Keep reading in Deuteronomy 8. He says, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of of slavery. I'm surprised that what he's describing there is exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. Really, this is almost more prophetic than it is a warning. God knew what was going to happen. He knew they were going to turn from him. That's why he warned them so emphatically. He knew they were going to turn. He warned them. He said, listen, once you get there and I give you the blessing and your heart is full, don't forget who brought you here. Don't start to serve the, the gifts over the one who gave you the gifts. Don't start to serve the creation over the creator. I want to give you three, <clears throat> actually uh, probably two points this morning about thankfulness. The first one is this. Thankfulness has a lot to do with what you think on. Or you could say it this way. Thankfulness has a lot to do with what you choose to meditate on. What you choose to think on. You know, every one of us, those of you that are in here that are, that are married, you know, we know this to be true in our marriages. If I focus on all of the negative things about my wife, then I'm going to be very unthankful and I'm going to be very unhappy with her. Or in turn, if she chooses to focus on all of my negative, she'd have a hard time doing that. I mean, there's really not that many things that she could discover, but she didn't say amen when I said that. I, we're going to have to talk after this. Um, but if she chose to focus, you know, if you choose to focus on the negative things of your spouse, very quickly, you're going to become unthankful for them. 
Thankfulness has so much to do with what you choose to meditate on and you choose to focus on. And the problem is, is that for many of us, we're like experts at this. We are literally experts at finding fault in others, in businesses, in performances, and in, in everything. I was amazed. This is like a lifestyle that, that some people live in where they're like professional critics. You know, they just, they love to criticize and critique everything. And like examine it and analyze it and find all the faults. And it could be like 99% amazing, but they're going to find the one little thing that was wrong about it and dwell on that and focus on that. You see this in, uh, in politics a lot, you know, where uh, someone gets up and gives a speech. And, the, you know, by and large, we're sitting there listening like, oh, it's pretty good. You know, it's a pretty good speech. Some good things were said. And then the, the, then the professionals come on. And it's like picking apart all the negative, every little negative thing that was said and picking apart this. And don't let that be you. You don't want to be a professional fault finder. I remember when I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, every, twice a week we would have a chapel service. And we had literally the best speakers from around the world coming and speaking at those chapel services. Many of them had graduated from Will Roberts University, um, and they were, you know, world-renowned people. I mean, we had, you know, people that were in ministry, great leaders in the nation, politicians, different people that would come and, and speak and give their, their testimony at chapel. And I'm just, you know, I'm from Forest Hill, Louisiana, population 492, last time I checked, and I was just thrilled to be exposed to these amazing speakers. And some of the things that were said I'd never heard before. I never thought like that before. Just awesome. And I would be shocked at some of these others that had grown up in Tulsa, which, by the way, is the buckle of the Bible Belt. You know, if we live in the Bible Belt, Tulsa's got more churches. There's more churches on every corner. And not just churches, like 10,000 members here, 20,000 members here. I've never seen so many mega churches in my life. Huge, you know, but... So these people that had grown up in Tulsa, they went to school in Tulsa, they went to these huge churches. I was amazed to go back to the dorm room and after I had just heard a message that I thought was phenomenal, I would go back and I would hear them just literally picking every piece of it apart. Well, he said this, and but you know, the scripture says this, and just going back and forth, I'm saying, I don't know how you heard that, <laughs> but that is not what I heard out of that. But if you're not careful, that can get on you. That attitude of picking everything apart and judging and, 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 and finding fault. I, I don't like to be around people like that. And if I'm going to be close to somebody for very long, they, they cannot be that type of person. I, can't, I don't want to be around someone that always is finding fault in like everything. First of all, it's just annoying. And number two, it just drags you down. It pulls you down. And I don't want that to get, to get off on me. But thankfulness has a lot to do with what you think on. You know, some of you are going through some very hard times in your life right now. And that mindset may have slipped in a little bit and you're thinking, well, I don't have a lot to be thankful for right now. You need to, you need to think again. You need to reevaluate what you're thinking about. Well, I've got, I'm going through some hard times. I'm sure you are. And you can focus on that if you want to. But are you glad to just have breath in your lungs this morning? Are you glad that you're able to sit here this morning healthy and whole, that your kids are healthy and whole? Are you glad to live in America? Are you glad that your eternity is secure? Praise God. No, we have so much to be thankful for. And I don't know your specific situation. I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm not trying to say that it's not very difficult. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Ungratefulness is not the way to get success in it. And if you're going to, if you're going to come out of that and you're going to get victory over whatever you're going through, it's not going to be through meditating and dwelling on negative things and being ungrateful for your life. A lot of times this leads to people actually getting mad at God. Well, God, I don't know why you, just, why you let that happen in my life. You know, if God is really good and he's all powerful, I don't know why you would let this happen in my life. 
Well, who's to say that God did let it happen in your life? Number one, did you know that you make choices? And that there are things that are happening in your life because of choices that you make. It's not just God. Did you know that we live in a world, the Bible says, where Satan is the God of this world and he has power and authority and influence. And if, and if you don't resist him, that he can do some things in your life too. Did you know that? And I know the tendency for us is to think, well, God is all powerful. He could just do anything. He could change anything. But I'll say this. I said this a few weeks ago and I'll say it this morning. That's how children think. That's how my kids think. They go, well... You know, they'll, go, they'll be at the store, and Daddy, can you buy this for me? No, son, I'm not going to do that. Well, why? you got plenty of money. You can buy that. Thinking, you don't know how much money I have, number one. But that's, that's how my kids think. Well, Daddy, you could do that. Daddy, why, hey, can you go get us some donuts this morning? No. Well, why not? You could. I mean, you could buy it. You could go do that. I could. I, there's a lot I could do. But a responsible father, number one, does not give you every little thing that your heart, that your greedy little heart desires. And he does not rescue you from every little ounce of pain that you experience. What kind of father does that? What kind of leader does that? No, if we're going to grow in our lives, you don't just get rescued from every little ounce of pain and, and removed from the situation every time there's a little bit of pressure put on you. If you want to see a weak, immature, undeveloped child, then be that as a parent where you rescue them from every little bit of pain that they encounter or experience. The, the, mo the just, you know, slightest bit of discomfort, we immediately pull them out of it. No, they're going to be fragile if you do that. Be fragile to the world because the world is not going to do that for them. So God, does, God is a good father. He's the best father. So no, he doesn't just run and rescue you from every little bit of pain. He will be by your side through it. He will give you the answer and the solution for it. He will fill you and empower you with the Holy Spirit to overcome it yourself with him empowering you. But no, he won't just come and remove the situation every single time. Don't get me wrong. God answers prayer in a miraculous way. Don't, don't make the mistake of that. But so many times when we pray, it's not God coming in to just rescue you. It's God coming in and giving you the blueprint and the plan for you to follow and walk it out in obedience. And that's how you're going to experience victory in your life. There have been multiple times in my marriage where... You know, <laughs> for one reason or another, we were experiencing strife in a particular season. And I'm a man of prayer, so I go to pray about it. And I am amazed. God never wants to talk to me about my wife. It's amazing. I mean, I go out tell him all the things she's doing. He never wants to hear. He doesn't want to talk to me about her. He wants to talk to me about me. And I'm thinking, God, you could just reach down and and change this about her or affect this in her. You could just do it. You're powerful. You could do it. But every time he wants to talk to me about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to respond and how I'm going to change the situation through my obedience. I think, well, that's just, that's frustrating, you know, because I just want him to reach down and adjust and make changes. But that's, that's immaturity. That's selfishness. We don't want to take responsibility and do it for ourselves. And what that kind of thinking leads to is unthankfulness. Because if you're not careful, you end up just looking at all the things that God has not done in your life or that God will not do in your life, and you don't have any thankfulness for all the things that He has done in your life and has accomplished in your life. I'm going to tell you something. We have a lot to be thankful for this morning. You have things to be thankful for in your life that you don't even know about. You don't know how many times God has rescued you, protected you, preserved you, gave grace and favor to you in a situation that you would have otherwise been denied or not received what you were after, but you got favor from God. You don't know those things. I guarantee you, every one of us in this room have so much more to be thankful for than we even know. If we tried to write it all down, it would only be 5% of the things that we have to be thankful for. But... Thankfulness is connected to what you choose to think on. And many of us in this room this morning need to change our thinking. And if this is something that you've, been a, that you've made a habit, and this is something that you've 
done in your life for years is to dwell on the negative and think on the negative. I'm telling you, it's, it's rooted in there and it's going to be difficult to change overnight. Because for many of us, this is just a habit. This is a pattern. For many of us, we don't even know we're doing it. And sometimes it takes somebody else to point it out to us and that's just not pleasant. But so many times it, it will take someone else to point it out to you and say, you know, you, you just are very negative. And you, you just focus on the negative all the time. And I don't want to be around you anymore, so I'm taking my toys and going home. <laughs> no, Philippians 4, 8, this is what Paul said. I love this. Talking about what we think on. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul shows us right there that it is a choice what we think on and it is a choice what we meditate on. Paul did not say that there was anything untrue or dishonorable or unjust or unlovely that we could think on. He knows that there are those things out there. He's not saying think about these things because the, you know, the other, we don't have anything else to think on and the others don't exist. No, he knows that there's so many things that are dishonorable and unlovely and unjust that are happening. But he said, take control of your thought life and choose what you think on. Don't just allow your mind to be like a a stream that, that takes the easiest path? No, you, you control it. You build a dam and you, you make it go where it needs to go. You control your thoughts. You are in control of your thoughts. Paul said in another place, taking every thought captive and making it submitted in obedience to Christ. So no, you have authority over your mind and what you think about. You can choose to think on other stuff. And sometimes this is intentional. You know, I've done this many times. I typically do this every year, actually, around Thanksgiving, where I'll go into my (coughs) journal and I'll write down a list of, you know, major areas in my life, maybe my marriage, my kids, my, my parents, and I'll write down, I'll write their name or that relationship, and I'll just begin to list things that I'm thankful for. In that relationship. Sometimes I've, I've mailed them to the, the people that I was writing about. Just to let them know that I appreciate you. I thank you. I'm thinking about you. And you begin to make a list of all the things that you're thankful for about that. This would do wonders. If there's somebody in your life that you're just furious with right now. It would do wonders for you to sit down and do what I'm talking about. To take a list and write down all the things that you're thankful for about them and about that relationship. And you go, well, I sat down for an hour and I could only think about one. Take that one and run with it. Meditate on that one thing. Focus on that. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think on these things. The second thing I want to tell you about thankfulness this morning is that thankfulness starts in your heart, but it is not complete until it reaches your lips. Thankfulness starts in your heart, but it is not complete until it reaches your lips. And all the wives said amen this morning. They know. The ladies tend to be better vocally, you know, uh, expressing things with their words. And men are not always as good at it. And that's not true in every case, but just as a, general, as a sweeping generalization this morning. But it's not enough just to be thankful in your heart. Especially when it comes to people, but even with God. If it were enough to be thankful in your heart, even with God, then why does the Bible talk so much about letting praise continually be on your lips? If he knows that you're thankful in your heart, why does he want to hear it coming out of your mouth? Because thankfulness is not complete until it reaches your mouth. And that's why the Bible is filled with praise. The longest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms, is pretty much nothing but praise 
extolling, exalting God coming out of his mouth. In Psalm chapter 34, verse 1, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And that's just one verse, but there's dozens almost exactly like it where David says, I will praise you all of the time. Your your praise will be on my lips. I will worship you. I will praise you. What is that? That's giving vent to thankfulness. And so many of us, we know how to give vent to everything else. We give vent to anger. We give vent to our opinions. We know how to open our mouth with other things. But when it comes to praise, we're silent so many times. And it's it's not just with God. I mean, certainly that's the most important relationship. That we should be verbal to God about our praise. That's why praise and worship is so important. Listen, I I know I'm I'm still on the stage playing the drums. And uh, listen, if any of you play the drums... Anybody plays the drums? Y'all want to come talk to me? We'll get you up there. We'll, we'll help you out. I'm, I'm not trying to hold on to the drums. We, as a matter of fact, while I'm at it, if you are a male vocalist, we are looking for male vocalists as well. Come find me. Sorry, ladies. We got enough ladies. We need some men that can sing. If you sing, come talk to me. All right, that's a whole other subject. Where was I going with that? Oh, so I'm, I'm on the drum, and I mean, I sometimes get off beat because I'm trying to, I'm trying to worship. I think this morning I felt the anointing, the presence of God coming in, praise and worship, and I'm trying to play the drums. I'm thinking, do I really want to play, or do I just want to lift my hands and worship right now? Because it's, it's amazing. So if I wasn't on the stage, I can guarantee you I'd be down here with you, and I would be worshiping and because God is going to hear my voice. And I don't care who's around me looking. I don't care if it looks weird to you. It doesn't matter because it's not for you. I'm not singing for you. I'm not raising my hands for you. I'm doing it for God. And he's going to hear it and he's going to see it because he deserves it and he's worthy of it. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at how many people will yell and shout and scream for their favorite football team, but they're silent when it comes to praising God. Blows me away. I know we don't always think of it like that. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to yell louder for the saints than I am for Jesus. To me, that's an insult to him. Because what, what else do I have? I mean, what else can I do but to let him know how thankful I am? You know, I, I give him my life. I can live it. I can give him my obedience. And I know that means a lot to him, but I want him to know from my mouth, I want him to hear it from me every chance I get. God, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful for you and everything that you've given, and and I'm going to live for you. Praise has to reach your lips. Now, we know that with, with God, but even with people. You know, I did this a few years ago where I realized that I was thinking a lot of really nice things about my wife, and I wasn't telling her. You know, she, she'd say something to me about, you know, something or other. And I would think, well, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? I, I, I love that aspect. I'm so thankful for that. And you can see the look on her face. Well, like, you didn't tell me. And I'm thinking, I, I began to kind of look at my life. And I would realize I would be looking at her across the room. And she'd be cooking or she'd be doing something with the kids. And I would be thinking, man, I love that woman. Look, she's so awesome. Just serves and... I just love her. I'm thinking, and and for whatever reason, I don't know, it just never made it to my lips. Maybe maybe my words had already been all burned out for the day. And so I I had to be intentional about it, but I had to start when I caught myself thinking that, I would go over there to her and I would say it. And maybe it was a little strange or awkward or, you know, to her like, huh, (laughs) okay. But... I had to be intentional about it. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it by any means, but this is a principle that not just with God, but even with people, thankfulness is not complete until it reaches your lips. And I can tell you right now, there are people in your life that need to hear from you how thankful you are for them. There are people that you need to call after this service, that you need to text, that you need to write a letter to, that you need to communicate to how thankful you are for them. And especially if it's somebody that you think that you don't have a lot to be thankful for and that's a relationship that you're struggling with, I'm telling you, it would be like magic 
if you would write them and, or communicate to them how much you appreciate them and how much you are thankful for them. Especially if you've been, I see some people hugging right now, just say, I love you. See, I'm so thankful for you. They're getting started early. You can do it now or you can wait till after church. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but there are some relationships that are strained in this, maybe in this room or maybe both parties are not in the room, but there are some relationships that are strained. And you'd be shocked that all they've heard from you is complaining, criticism, negativity. You would be shocked at how the Holy Spirit could work if you would just release some thankfulness into that relationship. And I, pr I tell you to pray and ask God to help you write that letter or write that message or that communication because he can get involved in it. The Bible says one of, my, one of my favorite scriptures. I hate when I say one of my favorite scriptures and then I can't remember like exactly how it's said. <laughs> but it truly is one of my favorite scriptures. Um, it basically says, this book of Psalms, and I don't remember the reference, but it basically says there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Oh, I love that. Isn't it so easy to use your mouth as a sword just to cut people and cause damage and rip things apart? But he said, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Some of you in this room, God's wanting to use your mouth to bring healing to a situation, to a relationship. Don't sit around and wait for the other person. It, it, you're, you're taking a, a, a step of faith has nothing to do with them. And matter of fact, it may not ever be reciprocated and it may not ever be returned, and that's okay. You just be obedient to do your part. Praise God. Last thing I want to say this morning, and we're going to close, is that when you start talking about thankfulness, sometimes you can become very aware of the fact that you are not receiving any thanks for what you're doing. It's not the goal this morning. As a matter of fact, the best posture that a Christian can take on this is to always give thanks but to never expect any. Because if you start meditating on giving thanks, you're going to start to realize, you know, I'm not getting a lot of thanks. I'm, I'm doing quite a bit and I'm not receiving any. But your mentality needs to be to always give thanks and never expect any. Because just like we were talking about even in the offering, God is the one who is overseeing what you're doing. And he sees it, and he's going to reward it. And it doesn't matter whether you ever get thanked by man or, or not. Because really, everything that we're doing, we're supposed to be doing as under the Lord, as the Bible teaches. Amen. Let's stand on our feet this morning.